North Korea hotting up. Now, the interesting thing about China is that it hides its propaganda behind these uh, milk toast headlines. The Global Times is basically the Communist Party mouthpiece. They release a lot of their agenda in these editorials that appear in the Global Times. One came out yesterday and the headline is China must be ready for worsened North Korea ties. Sounds quite a, you know, dry, stale, boring article, but if you actually read into it, the, the nuggets are always in there. It states, quote, if the North Korean nuclear issue boils over, a war on the peninsula is unavoidable. The war will bring more risks than the tough sanctions on Pyongyang could to China. If China does not tackle the conundrum now, it will face more difficult choices in the future. So they're starting to turn against North Korea, their ally, by the sounds of it, after this aggressive stance by Trump. The article continues, Beijing hopes to maximize the interests of all stakeholders, but if it fails, in the end, it still has the capability to strike back at any side that crosses the red line. So Beijing is announcing its own red line in terms of North Korea. They came out a few days ago and said if there is an attempt to overthrow the North Korean leadership, they will go to war. Again, they always put out these statements, very aggressive statements in their official mouthpiece. No, nobody really picked this one up, but they're basically saying they have a red line and they're moving closer towards it as regards North Korea. Daily Mail reports Pacific's top Navy officer says America must assume Kim Jong-un will nuke America. Again, there's speculation how many years will it take before they get that ICBM missile to reach the West Coast? Well, the Navy's top officer in the Pacific has warned that the North Korean crisis is real and the U.S. must assume Kim Jong-un intends to launch nuclear attacks on America and its allies. He is Admiral Harry B. Harris Jr. Quote, there is some doubt within the intelligence community whether Kim Jong-un has that capability today or whether he will soon, but I have to assume he has it. The capability is real and that he's moving towards it, Harris said, according to Fox News. The North Korean crisis is the worst he's ever seen. So maybe those people in South Korea who are quite blasé about it should be more alarmed given that he's a quite a prominent voice saying that it's the worst situation he's seen given that it's been rolling on for the best part of two decades. Mentioned this earlier, Zero Hedge reports, Trump warns there's a chance of a major, major conflict with North Korea. That was during an interview with Reuters where he was actually quite kind to Kim Jong-un. Bizarrely, he said, quote, he's 27 years old. His father dies, took over a regime. So say what you want, but that's not easy, especially at that age. I'm not giving him credit or not giving him credit. I'm just saying that it's a very hard thing to do. So he was actually somewhat kind to Kim Jong-un, but he also said there was a chance of a major, major conflict soon. Meanwhile, Vladimir Putin has come out and said that the situation in North Korea has, quote, seriously deteriorated. So again, the rhetoric there is heating up. That's what Putin said during a meeting Thursday after a Kremlin meeting on Thursday. Quote, we call on all states involved in the region's affairs to refrain from military rhetoric and seek peaceful, constructive dialogue. But he says it's seriously deteriorated. The Sun reports Kim Jong-un ready to send army of up to 500,000 women soldiers to the front line. That'll probably be celebrated by feminists across the world. If war with the US erupts, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is ready to send up to 500,000 women soldiers to the front line if the war with the US breaks out. According to defectors' estimates, battalions of female soldiers took part in the nation's biggest ever live firing exercise to mark the 85th anniversary of the military's creation this week. Of course, they keep saying whenever there's an anniversary of the military or of the founder of the country that that is going to mark the sixth nuclear test that will then lead to a US military strike on North Korea. It hasn't happened yet, and that can only be a good thing as we seek to de-escalate these tensions in the region. The Battle of Berkeley yesterday, which didn't actually happen because the uh, Antifa chicken neck cowards didn't show up, <laughs> and the rally was peaceful. Imagine my shock, they don't show up and it's actually peaceful, some kind of coincidence there. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Bill Nye uh, again with his um, social justice hysteria uh, with his Netflix special right now. There's actually a clip from his 1996 show, which I saw earlier today, where he was talking about how there's an XX chromosome and an XY chromosome. There aren't more than two genders, which is interesting given what he's saying now. But we've got Leanne McAdoo in studio. Leanne, let's talk about Berkeley, Mario Savio. And there are actually a, a, yes. there's a monument in Berkeley dedicated to him which says, 
quote, the most beautiful thing in the world is free speech. The people at Berkeley now don't seem very dedicated to that idea, do they? Right, exactly. And I've actually got a clip. Um, if we can get it ready, I would love to just remind people where this uh, this fight for to honor free speech on campus, where it all began, just kind of giving you a little history. These students were actually fighting against their super conservative administration, demanding that they bring in more liberal speakers. And that was at a time when they would shut down. You know, they say, this is the campus. You don't have free speech rights here. You don't have free access to the First Amendment. So these students were like physically fighting and getting violent to bring liberal speakers onto their campus. And now, of course, we can see the exact inverse is going on. But let's take a little, you know, walk through history there with this very famous speech on the Sproul Hall steps. And so we can see these are the same these are the same sort of activists now who have gone on to be, to become these liberal uh, professors who are still kind of pumping out this, um, you know, throw your throw yourself against the machine. Tell it it won't. It won't work if we'll throw ourselves against the levers and we're not your product, you can't buy us. So very powerful, but it's interesting to see how it's completely now flipped and that they are using that same power to silence any conservative voices on campus. Well, it's like Bill Maher said, it, it was the cradle of free speech. Now it's the cradle for crybabies. <laughs> we have the perfect antidote and you're wearing it yes. right now. Yes, the uh, this I'm one of your groupies here with the conservative conservatism is the new counterculture. And that's exactly it, because we can see, you know, how things have completely flipped, flipped over uh, to now we have students actually throwing themselves against the machine there at Berkeley. And these are uh, your alt right people. We've got, you know, Baked Alaska coming up. Lauren Southern there yesterday uh, made some very good points when she was on the live stream with us. Um, just that this is so important for people to stand up for the First Amendment, regardless of what side of the issue you're on, because it affects all of us. And it's not about aligning yourself to a certain political party or a certain president, because politicians, presidents, they come and they go. But our fundamental rights, we have to preserve them. The government is not going to protect them for us. So just like we, you know, we see decades ago where it, the, the liberal students are having to fight to be heard and fight to have access to free speech, well, now it's flipped and it's it's gone the other way now. Uh, conservatism, that that's the new counterculture. <laughs> well, when they basically control everything, entertainment, media, Hollywood, mm -hmm. music industry, what else could be the counterculture? You can't be the dominant culture and the counterculture. It, does, it just doesn't work. Yet they're so afraid of losing that control that that T-shirt, that image, that slogan triggers them like nothing before. <laughs> so get it now, InfoWarsStore.com. Seamless transition. And it is very soft. I really do like the good quality. Very nice soft fibers in this t-shirt. And it's limited edition. It's only going to be around for so much longer because it's a limited run. It is high quality. Conservatism is the new counterculture culture t-shirt available at InfoWarsStore.com for a limited time. Uh, Berkeley, they're teaming up with uh, Bill Ayers now, Leanne, which is yes. interesting given that he's a convicted domestic terrorists, some kind of connection there. Well, that should explain everything to you. So there was a guest actually on Tucker Carlson uh, basically making the case that they have the right to resist right-wing provocateurs from coming to campus. They have the right to do this, and they can make these um, militant threats in order to shut this down. Meanwhile, they're working with violent domestic terrorist Bill Ayers, He's now um, officially linked to Antifa through his group Refuse Fascism. And, of course, he's famous for the Weather Underground uh, domestic terror organization that he helped found. They oh. bombed the Pentagon. And <laughs> it's just like, that's fine. Those type of liberal provocateurs, that's completely fine. And isn't it interesting, too, how just a, a year or so ago, the buzzword was anti-government. And it was all about, you know, uh, demonizing these anti-government folks. But now it's super cool and trendy to be anti-government. You must resist. Well, it's amazing, isn't it? You look at Black Lives Matter and it's the same situation. It's okay to be violent and radical if you're on the left and the right. media will legitimize <laughs> it. They will authenticate it and they won't call out, they won't disavow their fringe extremists. Like We've never denied that the right or conservatives, whatever, have fringe extremists. We disavow them. They don't. They encourage them. Now they're working with um, the convicted domestic terrorist, Bill Ayers. <laughs> they're pepper spraying people. They're punching them in the face. They're stabbing people. It continues to happen, but we're going to talk about it later. 
They basically failed to show up yesterday, Leon, yeah. right? We, we were all here expecting these massive riots and virtually nothing happened. Right. Well, the, it, it appears as if the, the cops were there in riot gear. They were prepared. They obviously were not given the stand down order. Could it be because there was a lot of speculation uh, regarding the mayor's ties to uh, by any means necessary? You know, he liked this group publicly on his Facebook. What's the deal there? So then then it appears as if the police were told, you know what, do what you, you got to do. Try to keep the peace. Um, but it's interesting that we see these little uh, militant arms of, of these activist groups being allowed to make these militant threats to uh, threaten <clears throat> GOP marchers, for instance, in Portland, where they were having to cancel that Rose Parade that had gone uh, 67 years they had been in that parade, had to cancel it because of anti, anti-fascist anti threats that were made. So then they were like, felt really empowered. Like anyone who says violence doesn't work, or violence, uh, militant threats don't work. We'll see, see how powerful we were and effective we were. We were able to shut down Milo and Coulter, now the Portland Rose Parade. They're gonna come target every single event that they possibly can. And the left is going, and the establishment, our, our representatives are going to coddle them and encourage them because they have plans to move this country more progressive to the left as far as they possibly can. So they want they want to tear down the fabric of what this society, of what America was founded on, so that they can rebuild it um, in a really regressive way. Exactly. And of course, why AF, this conservative group who basically cucked out and said, we can't provide security for Ann Coulter, they need to take some of the blame because that was easy enough to pull out. They could have crowdfunded it, so they're rightly being criticised. That's why Ann Coulter had to pull out of her speech. Gavin McKinns actually gave her speech in his words, or he read out her speech. We might get to that clip later on. Other news, though, Leanne, you, you wanted to talk about Bill Nye, right? Yes. Well, and this is something that's interesting as well. Uh, ben Shapiro is is trademarking it, the science science. Uh, because it's the new science of the left. It's it's this cult, this religion of the left is their, is their uh, science that they've got. So now Bill Nye, you know, it's not enough that he's got his uh, gender spectrum <laughs> music that he's put out, but now he's also suggesting that in order to save the world from climate change, uh, we might want to punish people in developed countries for having too many children. Hmm. Even though we're basically having no children it's at this right. point, it's falling off a cliff. It's a demographic suicide. Right. That's why they're having to import so many people from other countries to help revitalize certain areas because there's just the birth rate is down in Western countries. And they're basically like, oh, people in Nigeria, they hardly emit any carbon dioxide. Yeah, because they've got no standard of living. They've got no <laughs> quality of life. They want everybody dragged down to that level rather than allowing Africa to develop, you know, getting these clean technologies in there, they just want to drag us all down to that level. But of course, the same situation isn't going to be applied to them. They're still going to be in their ivory tower, right? Right. And this is, I mean, and this is what is just so insane. Bill Nye is not a scientist, okay? He's a comedian. Why is he being paraded out to teach us now about the gender spectrum? My sex junk is the, the music video. And then now basically putting this out there, which young people are going to, I know I got really uh, propagated with this when I was in school about how, well, you know, we probably shouldn't have kids, maybe just one because the planet is, is reached capacity and we have to save the planet. So don't have children. I mean, wh what is this globalist agenda here and why Bill Nye of all people? Who is this guy? It's amazing. Of course, now he says there's a gender spectrum. Back in 96, he came out with a video saying there were only two genders, which is scientific. But now <laughs> he's no longer scientific yet. He still calls himself the science guy. We'll be back. Alex Jones Show Live, InfoWars. Military news revealed America's backup plan in case of war with China. The United States can no longer count on its Pacific air bases to be safe from missile attack during a war with China. On the contrary, a 2015 paper from the influential Rand Corporation noted that in the worst case scenario, larger and accurate attacks sustained over time against a less hardened posture could be devastating, causing large losses of aircraft and prolonged airfield closures. 
Kadena Air Base in Okinawa, due to its relative proximity, would be hardest hit. To up the stakes, China in September 2015 publicly revealed its DF-26 ballistic missile, which can strike Anderson Air Force Base in Guam nearly 3,000 miles away from the Chinese mainland. Anderson and Kadena are among the U.S. military's largest and most important overseas bases. Enter Tinian. The lush small island near Guam is emerging as one of the Air Force's backup landing bases. On February 10, the Flying Branch announced that it selected Tinian as a divert airfield in the event access to Anderson Air Force Base, Guam or other Western Pacific locations is limited or denied. Quote, in the Pentagon's 2017 budget request it asked for $9 million to buy 17. Five acres of land in support of divert activities and exercise initiatives. The Saipan Tribune reported, in peacetime, the expanded Tinian airfield will host up to 12 tanker aircraft and associated support personnel. For divert operations, according to the Air Force, Tinian is now a sleepy place. During World War II, the 4th and 2nd Marine Divisions captured the island which later based the B-29 Super Fortresses in Gay and Bokkar which took off from Tinian's North Field and dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. An arsenal during the war, most of its airstrips are now abandoned and unused. The island's other former airbase, West Field, is a small, neglected international airport. The Air Force first wanted Saipan for its airfield. Very close to Tinian, Saipan has 15 times the population, a larger airport and a harbor. But this proposal met opposition from a local activists due to the effect on coral, potable water, local transportation and socio-economic factors on surrounding communities. Quote, Stars and Stripes reported, the opposition even included the pro-business Saipan Chamber of Commerce which worried that Tinian's rusty airport would miss out on the flood of Pentagon spending. Saipan's airport is also overcrowded, with locals not happy about the prospect of hundreds of airmen flying in for military exercises lasting up to eight weeks every year. In a way, it's a return to the past. The United States dispersed air bases to varying degrees and in different parts of the world during the Cold War. But as the threat of a Soviet missile attack evaporated and post-Persian Gulf War budget cuts hit hard in the 1990s, the trend shifted toward larger megabases that operate on economies of scale. But dispersed bases are more survivable, Rans Allen Vic noted in his 2015 paper. Dispersing aircraft across many bases creates redundancy in operating surfaces and facilities. This enhances basic safety of flight by providing bases for weather or in-flight emergency diverts. It also increases the number of airfields that adversary forces must monitor and can greatly complicate the targeting problem, in part by raising the prospect that friendly forces might move among several bases, at the least dispersal, because it increases the ratio of runways to aircraft forces and attack it to devote considerably more resources to runway attacks than would be the case for a concentrated force. It also greatly increases construction and operating costs to spread aircraft across many major bases. To mitigate these costs, dispersal bases tend to have more modest facilities and, at times, might be nothing more than airstrips. Robert Beckhusen is the managing editor of War is Boring.